Hi everybody, hope you're all doing well and having a great day. I'm Julia Charlton, I'm the Chair of the Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce and I'd like to thank you for joining us today at our online webinar. And it's well worth your time because uh, we have a great guest today who is going to have a discussion with us about low code and how low code development practices, uh, platforms and practices will be if they aren't already part of the future of all global application development activity. So studies have shown that by 2030, low code development will be a 187 billion US dollar market and make up a predominant percentage of all software development activity. So despite its great relevance, many people aren't aware of the concept of low code development. Um, it's not surprising as according to studies, only 0.5% of the world's population is familiar with the processes of coding. But considering the fact that the world economy is heading into a very digitalized future, it's safe to say that knowledge of these digital tools will become more important as time goes on. So I'm so excited to be joined today by Nicholas Bowman. Nick is the CEO of Revo.io, a pioneering low-code development platform based in South Africa, using best-in-class digital infrastructure to help provide partners with scalable, affordable, and swiftly deployable solutions. They make use of Microsoft Power Platform, as well as the no-code software development tool, Bubble.io, to um, create reliable and impactful innovation in South Africa and hopefully to other Commonwealth countries and the rest of the world. So, Nick, I'm so happy to have you here today, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us. We're really looking forward to hearing all about your work and success stories. So now I'll hand over to you for a short presentation, and then we'll be discussing um, the, and deep diving into what you're actually doing and what low code is um, on a deep basis. So over to you, Nick. So what I just want to go through in the presentation that we put together here is just to give everyone a bit of an idea of where we are, what our journey's been, uh, what we've got up to so far, as well as start to touch on the broad concepts of what low code is. And just so that when we go into the next part of the conversation, it's quite clear where it's relevant and hopefully you can find uh, the different aspects which will have an impact on, on your business or your different ideas. So just to start off first, I thought we'd cover what drives us as Revo. Why did we get into the space? Uh, what really makes us tick? And I think the important part is that we deeply believe in the power of technology and in the in innovative capacity of people. We see low code as a catalyst to bring more brilliant ideas to life. If you look at where technologies come from in the past, I mean, we've really made huge strides over the last 40, 50 years. But some of the promise of technology in terms of how it's going to impact our daily lives, the kind of uh, mundane tasks that it's going to remove from what we need to do, have not quite been realized. In fact, a lot of studies and um, kind of research would suggest that the impact of technology in, over recent times has actually made us uh, more work driven, more focused on what we're up to on a daily basis and not freed us up to focus on higher value items. And we believe that low code is truly going to unlock that as suddenly the accessibility of technology to businesses, to people, becomes um, something which is really easy to, to get your hands on. So that drives us, that makes us excited, and uh, we can't wait to share what uh, low code can potentially do for you. If we look at our little history, um, I think we can trace it back to 2017, which is when the unexpected journey begins. I call it an unexpected journey because at that point in time, we didn't start out expecting to be what we've become. We were the uh, tech development team within a business that was looking to disrupt the South African insurance industry. I think a pivotal decision taken at that point in time was as a small business, how did we actually put tech in place, which is gonna allow us to be disruptive and scale, but also works for the kind of budget that we had. And without really thinking about it, we ended up uh, opting for a, a Microsoft uh, product, which has later morphed into being their, their premier low code tool. So, Unexpectedly, we began and became uh, pioneers in, in the low-code space, although at the time, it wasn't really branded as a particular low-code tool. As the journey went on, uh, we had some funding from a big listed organization, uh, kind of getting us going and making sure that we were able to invest in different development items. But that funding was, was later revoked, which put um, a few issues in place. So uh, we had the kind of do or die decision. And instead of packing up shop, we decided that we had the skills internally that we believed we could still tackle the market and, and we continued on as we were. Uh, after knocking on a lot of different doors, we eventually found a new partner that we could work with who was interested in what we were trying to do 
and the tools we were using to do that. But one of the prerequisites was that the business be split into the two components that it had, which was an insurance side, as well as the technology side. And that's really where the sowing the seeds idea comes from. As soon as the technology side was split out, we realized that the application of what we were doing was relevant to a number of different businesses and not just the team that we were part of. And so the concept of us being a technology business that served multiple different organizations was, uh, was planted. And from there, the Revo that we know today has kind of come into being. After a more time in this space, uh, operating quite closely with our partner and developing very exciting uh, solutions in that space, we decided to take the leap of faith, which was to split Revo out completely and make us a self-standing, self-sufficient business, which then offered these services to the market and looked to deploy low code in as many different uh, spaces as we could, which was a very exciting time and very, very stressful, but we had a nice team around us and we were, we were very keen on making the impact that we could. It was actually in that year where we identified this differentiator that we had, which is that we were operating in a low code space. It sounds uh, counterintuitive, but up until that point, we just thought we were operating with really useful development tools, which allowed us to build uh, robust solutions really quickly. But it took us a while to understand this low code movement. And in fact, how we were embracing that methodology and completely at the forefront of this low code wave, uh, which we believe is still coming, um, but it's certainly gathering momentum. And then in 2021, we really hit the ground running and uh, say, welcome to the real world. Uh, that's when things got, got interesting. Uh, we realized our value proposition, we had to go out there and find new clients. We had to understand our internal process and really refine those to ensure that the kind of solutions we were offering were uh, absolutely exceptional, which is what we've always aimed to be. So we're very excited about how far we've come. We, we love the journey we've been on, but we're probably more excited about the future. Uh, the concept of low code, the methodology is really starting to gain momentum. In many parts of the world, it's highly prevalent. And in fact, there's a number of listed organizations across, um, especially in South Africa, but also in the US and the UK, who have now adopted low code tools to allow their development of internal tools to be far quicker, as well as no sacrifice around things like security and uh, scalability. So with those guys kind of opening up their eyes to the benefits of low code, it's only a matter of time before all organizations realize how applicable it is in their space. So we're looking forward to what's to come and we're excited to uh, the kind of opportunities that we're starting to see in the clients who, who we're working with. It really is some revolutionary stuff. So that's all I wanted to touch on really about us for now. Um, but I wanna take you a bit into low code. I do get the sense that for a lot of people, this is a completely foreign topic, uh, but just to contextualize how important this is gonna be, Gartner, who's a leading platform around research and trend analysis, have suggested that 65% of all applications uh, will be built on low-code platforms by 2024. And that is a significant number. So if you aren't aware of low-code, um, if it's not something you think is going to have application, hopefully that changes your, your perception a little bit. This really is going to be something that changes the way that businesses operate, as well as how different ideas become, uh, come to life. So just to delve a little bit deeper, what exactly is low code? So low code is a shift in the approach to solving problems with software. Software has existed for uh, many, many years, and it's always been out to solve different problems. But typically the way that you'd have to go about it is initially a scoping exercise, very detailed, picking a program, pre programming language, picking where you're gonna host the actual application, and then eventually getting to solving the problem. Whereas with low code, the application and the different modules are already available to you. So you start with solving the problem. And the actual way of development is moved. Instead of writing lines of code, you're able to do visual first programming, which you can imagine is very similar to designing a PowerPoint presentation. Um, there's obviously some more complexity than that, but it does give you the ability, anyone who's worked with um, some kind of pretty standard tools to design applications, to understand how they work, to build something which is gonna save you time in your day-to-day. -day. And the other big benefit is how modular, modularized these different uh, components are. So one of the big issues with traditional development is around security. Before you've even started to solve the problem, you have to think about how am I going to prevent some uh, unwanted attackers from entering this application, from stealing data, from doing those kinds of nefarious activities. And in a, in a low code space, you are reliant a little bit on the platform but the platform itself is taking care of things like security. So you don't have all of that overhead in terms of uh, the amount of time that needs to be spent on some of those components. And low code is really can, the easiest way to describe uh, how, it, how it works is to think of Lego. 
In a traditional programming space, you have to build all the Lego blocks and then you put them together. In a low code space, a lot of the blocks already exist. So you build those together and then you focus on the areas where you really need to uh, customize and make some tweaks. Uh, the, the next big change is around the actual development approach. Uh, your, your traditional development is really something which has a long uh, cycle before development can even start. You need to understand from uh, a business, from a particular person, what the problem they're trying to solve is. Then you need to design all the complexity around the actual system that's going to do it. Uh, and then only after all of that complexity is solved and those challenges are addressed, can you actually work on the problem. Whereas with the low-code space, you're looking at solution-led development. Um, the actual applications are really quick to put together, and you get to spend all your time on what the problem you're trying to solve is. So it's really around the solution as opposed to trying to solve for the different complexities of whatever programming language you've chosen to, to actually uh, build the applications on. And the benefit of low-code is also around the fact that all of the complexity is, is typically managed by the platform. So if you think of things like security around uh, data, for example, the platform that you've chosen to build your low-code tools on will offer those services. And it's core to their offering that they are best in, in class. So things like security, uh, you do need to have some reliance on, on the underlying platform, but these platforms, you know, in, in some examples are, are run by Microsoft. So you can have good peace of mind that if you know, around 70% of the world are comfortable uh, running applications through Microsoft, that they're going to be able to take care of their low-code platform. So things like that aren't issues that you have to have as a low-code developer, and you get to really focus on the problem at hand. And then finally, and this is one of the big differences between low-code and no-code, which I think we might touch on a bit later, but everything that you build in low-code space is extensible with pro-code. And that means your traditional development is by no means being replaced, but just the elements of it, which don't need to be duplicated every single time, uh, are taken away. So when you need to do complex tasks, there certainly is the ability to extend, use outside applications, third parties if necessary, or write completely custom code to handle very advanced logic, which is, which is why we see low code as a really neat way for businesses to solve all types of problems. There's, there's almost no restriction in terms of what you can do. So why is this exciting? From our perspective, this uh, allows a huge and exponential increase in accessibility to technology. And this is on various fronts. If you think of it from a business perspective, a lot of SMEs, particularly in the South African space, still use Excel as their primary business tool. They, don't, they aren't even aware that they have the ability to use low-code tools, which are at a very similar price point, but give them the full uh, robust application capabilities of an enterprise-grade application. But there's also the other side of things. You've got uh, startups and you've got entrepreneurs who might be non-technical or might not have the funding to go about uh, implementing the ideas in the real world. And low-code breaks down all those bar barriers and enables those kind of people to be entrants into the market, to get the ideas out there and to test them. And then finally, there's a huge impact on the job side of things. Uh, becoming a traditional developer requires a number of years of training, a number of years of experience. It's highly technical and is pretty tough for a lot of people to do. I myself don't have that technical background. I didn't study computer science degree at university. And I think that's true of a lot of people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't people out there with great ideas and who don't have the aptitude to do this. And low code allows those types of people to get involved in the tech space. And um, so we really believe it's, it's very exciting on both of those fronts in terms of what it can achieve. And then in terms of how you are actually able to deploy and leverage the, the solutions that are being built, low code allows for exceptional speed and agility. I think there's some stats around there that an application built in low code versus the same application built in a traditional space, you're dealing with uh, at a minimum half the time it takes uh, and up to potentially 10 times quicker to build in the low code space. It's extremely useful in terms of uh, quick testing, doing MVPs, POCs, but it's also got all the scalability and robust things within a platform to allow the application to really grow legs. And then the other benefit is because the tools are built in such a way that they do allow people with not a a supremely technical background to, to build and, and benefit from it, you actually aren't as bound to the different ways that or different choices you made along the way as you would be in a traditional approach. So changing various things which um, previously might take you many weeks or months is really quick in the low code space. You've got this insane agility that can be applied to all the problems that you're trying to solve, which is a huge benefit. And I think especially with organizations that have used traditional coding before, this really opens up the possibilities. Suddenly, you aren't as uh, 
restricted by the choices you've made and you can really go out there and give different things a try and as well as quickly roll them back if you need to. The next big benefit is the application of low code being extremely broad. I mean, we work with uh, partners in a number of different industries and all the different challenges are, are actually quite um, useful to come across because it gives us a lot of confidence in what low code can handle. And so far we haven't come across a problem that we can't solve. So we work across a variety of different industries. We have partners with a variety of problems. Uh, you have businesses looking to solve their internal workflow problems. You have other businesses looking to build products for external clients. And so far, as I said, low code really can uh, stand up to all of those different challenges and offer a proper solution there. And then finally, another benefit, and this is a big one, particularly when you think of organizations using legacy tools, the ability to run these low code solutions is far simpler than what uh, historically businesses have been used to. If you were to build a low code application, uh, this is typically gonna be maintained by the platform. So as long as everything's been built in a robust and um, I suppose diligent way, you're gonna have a tool that lasts for a long time. Any updates, upgrades that need to be made are handled by the platform. Uh, and you get to focus again on the solution that, that you've built and to continue to iterate on that. Whereas if you build in the traditional space, you need at least um, two people who are gonna be able to maintain the application to ensure that things are running correctly on servers, to make sure that if there's changes in the programming language that are used, that those updates are made and maintained over time. So there's a lot less overhead uh, in terms of the management of the applications as well. And then if that hasn't got you excited enough, I thought we'll just share this slide here, which touches on the different use cases of low code. And I'm not gonna go into detail around these. These are actually just the platforms that enable you to build uh, on top of them and build your solutions. And they're focused in all these different areas. So one of the objections and the challenges we get in the low code space is around, you know, this won't be able to solve my problem. This isn't gonna scale. But if you look at the types of problems that specific organizations and low code platforms are focusing on here, it's extremely broad. Everything from basic apps to, to AI, um, to chatbots and messaging, everything can be handled within the low code space. And again, if there is something that isn't in here, you can start with some of these tools to build the basic uh, building blocks and then extend it with pro code as necessary. It's a really open environment and very exciting, allowing a lot of people to get going very quickly. So as a final slide is, is where does that leave us as Revo and why are we excited about what we're doing? So we believe we're at the forefront of this low code wave and we're able to put the unique skills that we've accumulated over a number of years in the industry at work to solve complex problems across various industries. There is going to be a compounding effect um, thanks to low code, thanks to the amount of ideas that now are able to, to, take, to take flight and the types of people who are suddenly able to access roles in the low code space. I think there's gonna be a, a big shift in the world uh, brought on by low code and we are very excited to be at the forefront of that. And, and yeah, uh, going to watch with keen interest how things develop over time. Thanks, Julia. So that's a, a quick intro on, on us. Well, that was so interesting, Nick. Thank you very much. You really, uh, you really are a low-code evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> I love this, um, your phrase, uh, insane agility. Do you use that in your marketing or did you just come up with that? I think, yeah, I think that just came out of me now, but it's, it's, uh, it's very much a, a big positive in terms of, of how we get people to understand what the, the opportunity is. Yeah, I think that should be your marketing buzz buzz phrase, insane agility. So thank you so much. So, so it's obvious that the growth figures and this uptrending importance of these platforms, um, you know, they just can't be understated, can you? And I think one of the most effective ways to bring awareness and understanding to this digital innovation is to perhaps do a deep dive and have a really comprehensive look at what the process involves. So um, let's have a discussion about it, if that's okay. And if there are questions from the people who've dialed in, that's great. We can uh, take those and look at them later. So we've all heard of no code, but for a lot of us, I think low code, as you've pointed out, is a bit different and it isn't talked about so much. So what exactly is, the, I know you've, you did deal with it in your slide, but just walk me through it again. What's the difference between no code and low code? And why is low code so much better than no code? So, so no code is a real drag and drop interface. Mm -hmm. And it does allow people with pretty much no program experience at all to get involved, to build an application quite quickly. There's some really cool tools out there like Glide, which if you've got any understanding of Excel, you can basically have an application up and running very quickly. 
Um, and the no code tools are, I mean, I think that, that where the challenge comes in from a no code perspective is if you are looking to build really scalable applications or you've got a unique idea or unique approach, you're going to run into some walls at some time because they're not going to be able to cater for all the nuances that you might want to introduce into your application or into your internal business processes. So I think they're a great way for people with uh, no technical understanding to get going and they can scale and they can do all sorts of things. But why we focus on low code is that extensibility into the pro code space if you need to. So that makes the solutions really uh, un unrestricted in terms of what you can achieve and just means that any, any discussions that we go into, any situations where people are, are looking for a solution, we are fully confident that we can uh, solve any of those problems because there's just no restrictions in the tools that we've got to applying to the problem. Yeah. So for no code, I mean, I've been involved in like a no code challenge where you could build something in 24 hours and it's sort of like a competition of what could people come up with in no code in 24 hours. Do people, would you ever suggest it's a good idea to, to map out your thinking in no code and then move it to low code? Or would you always start with low code? Well, maybe what I haven't explained well enough is I'd say low code and no code are, are very similar. In fact, that they share probably the same building blocks to start. Mm -hmm. Low code is, um, I hope this doesn't confuse everyone, but low code is no code first approach. You only go to the pro code uh, space where you need to. So in, in most instances, you're going to find that there's a lot of similarity between the no code and the low code tools. But the big difference is when you need to go and do something more complex that's not handled by the platform, no code will lock you in and it'll be a struggle to go and achieve those or solve those problems. Whereas with low code, you've now got the ability to go out, use any systems out there that you want to or write your own code uh, and, and make sure that what you're trying to do gets done. Yeah, yeah. Do you think there's an institutional bias against low code solutions and organizations, you know, both from the tech industry of people who spent years of their lives studying something way more complicated and mm. businesses which have got massive sunk costs now in yeah. all kinds of systems and they maybe they just can't believe that they could actually have a workable solution that is cheaper and simpler. Do you think, do you think that's a factor in some of this at an institutional Definitely. level? Yeah, I think uh, both the types of institutions you've mentioned are, are challenges we come up against. I mean, you've got your traditional development institutions, which whether they really see this as a threat or perhaps believe their own rationalizations, I'm not sure, but they will say that these kind of low-code tools cannot handle the types of complexity that a traditional developer can actually build into an application. So there's a lot of resistance there. Uh, they will talk things like the fact that from a security perspective or a control perspective, you are handing over some of that to the low code platform that's doing uh, that you're building on top of. Whereas if you're doing it all in-house, you've got full control of it. But I think that's a bit of a myth in itself. I mean, even if you think of organizations who uh, use Amazon for their servers, there's a degree of control that's been handed over there already. So I think low code as a concept is probably existent uh, in even the traditional space where components that used to have to be done completely by hand at the beginning have been handed over to different organizations over time. Yeah. Because get a lot you know, of challenge. Unless, yeah, unless you're the government or some huge bank, you know, really, you're not, you cannot build everything from scratch, can you? No. And why would you? Because often the cost associated with that is far higher than if you just let Amazon uh, do your hosting for you. Yeah, and it would take you so long and be so expensive, and everything would be outdated by the time you'd finished it. You'd have to redo it, right? Exactly. And you're, you're, you're actually touching on exactly the benefits of low code, is all of that, is you don't waste time on things that have already been done. Don't go build a login module and worry about security when someone else who's got far more people dedicated to that problem are spending all their time on that. Yeah. And, and second, your second point around the, the institutional um, or the, rather the large corporates who've got legacy systems having a bit of a, um, what did we say, a, a, being a bit tentative around adopting low code, there, there certainly is that, particularly the bigger organizations. And I'm not always sure the fear is around the, the cost of it, it's around how robust will it be? And that's where specifically the Microsoft solution has been a real win for us because being able to refer to the security and the various different things that Microsoft handle gives these corporates a, a, a big peace of mind when dealing with these low-code tools. And once they've got their head around that, then suddenly it's a big playground for them. Suddenly, I mean, we've got um, some clients who their current release cycle is twice a year. That's the changes that they deploy that their different team members can get benefit from. 
And we've now reduced that. We've got two week uh, release cycles when we, we're deploying on these low code platforms. And so the impact that it has in their business is very, as soon as they have kind of got their head around the change in approach and the fact that they will be replacing some legacy systems, uh, the impact that it has on their business is just too exciting for them. And, uh, and then they leap at it and then they're all in. So there's definitely a bit of a, a bridge you need to cross, but, but once you are across, then I think they, they almost become the best clients. That's interesting, yeah, because you hear a lot about digital transformation of legacy businesses, but what you're talking about is digital transformation of fairly digital businesses, right? They have to move to a completely yes, yeah. way of thinking. That's probably more difficult because in my experience, tech people love to blind non-tech people, non-tech people, because I think we're all tech to an extent these days with science. Oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, gobbledygook, gobbledygook, right? Whereas what yep. you're saying actually cuts through a lot of that. Well, actually you can. A hundred percent. And and where I think, you know, some of these organizations are really old and they've got legacy systems, which you can't just turn off overnight. So where low code, again, has a, a huge advantage is, is we go up, that's fine. Leave that system in place. We'll integrate with that system and then we work from there. So in a lot of examples, we've taken it's called a 10 different legacy systems. We integrate with all of them and you've got one low code application, which is an aggregate of sorts and allows people to be far more effective in their roles. Yeah, or alternatively, because of its agility, you could actually run them in parallel for a while till everybody lets go of the comfort blanket of the original one, right? Which is mm. in a lot of so-called digital transformation that people can't let go of the old one. They run two systems for a while. I don't know. Exactly, but I think, I mean, that, that other concept around how slow improvements are to be made on these old legacy systems where initially you start with a bit of parity between the low code and the legacy tool i guess because you're pretty much just surfacing information but you know as soon as a user goes off oh, can it do x y and z and then you can add that in the low code tool within a, a two-week space very quickly you see that people migrate across right right so tell me about some of the projects you're working on at the moment or have worked on recently you know that that would be interesting for people to realize what you're actually achieving in the business world i think Sure. Uh, well, let me think of some, some good examples. So I think um, one of our favorite projects is in the South African insurance space. And this is where we are talking about taking a lot of information that's sitting on legacy systems, showing them to users in a different way. Um, and, and that's been a really exciting project. It's been a, a long and ongoing project. And the impact that it's had is you've got effectively a sales force that weren't digitized uh, until we got involved a little while back. And we've introduced tools. We've introduced uh, the ability to allow guys to actually work um, out of the office. It was a, and I mean, the, the timing on this was quite good. This was, we got involved just before COVID. More than we, quite, Nick, more than quite. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it really was. Um, and, and these guys, were, it would have been a, a real challenge because even now for um, some of the applications that the team needs to access, when they're working from home, they have to log into some remote VPN somewhere else. They have to load some application. It's extremely buggy and slow. And, inefficiencies that that would have introduced if they didn't have the alternative cloud solution would have been a, a huge problem. And not only that, I mean, even without the kind of COVID really ramping up the adoption, the amount of tools we could build in the space really quickly and that were A, replacing Excel, but adding so much functionality in that um, the types of things that people were able to focus on in their day to day shifted from a lot of admin mundane tasks to really value adding tasks. So when you're talking about trying to make a sale to a client. I mean, the, the whole um, approach moved from volume and just getting out there as many quotes as possible to actually spending time thinking what's appropriate, what, what's the end client gonna benefit from here? And we've been quite um, involved in, in that digital transformation journey, giving people things like mobile applications that they can now work on from anywhere, access to their data, and then as many automations as possible just to simplify um, their life. And that's, that's one example on one end of the spectrum, and that's in the insurance space, uh, and it's a very internal application. On another side of the spectrum, um, we've got, we, we deal with a client who's very involved in, in the health industry and will pass millions of rows of data. It's actually NHS data, so this is a, a UK-based client, um, to try and uncover different insights, to try and optimize the NHS process, again, to the benefit of clients, to the benefit, yeah, I know, big task. Um, you know, they, they do it, not us, luckily. But, but we've worked with them closely to figure out what's the best way to extract insights from this data because a big data dump of millions of rows uh, and then a couple of VLOOKUPs doesn't run so quickly. So you need an application around that. And then once you've actually got those insights, how do you make that available to people? 
So we work closely on A, extracting the information, presenting it in a really intuitive and user-friendly way, and then building the applications around it so that any user who wants to access this information can log in and they've got the ability to do so. That's been really transformative there. Um, I think we've, uh, I mean, another nice client to touch on is on um, the NGO side, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that this can have there. And particularly from Microsoft's perspective, they invest heavily in NGOs. So you get a reduction in the license fees. There's all sorts of resources that they make available. And we've worked closely with an NGO um, to improve their internal processes. I think they've always suffered from the types of employees that they can attract. And they've got a lot of um, trainees and things like that in place, which do kind of limit the continuity of the business. To, so to have a system in place, which allows them to just follow step-by-step -step process, they know what they're doing. They know they're compliant with their kind of uh, regulatory um, requirements, as well as being able to report back to their board and various people who are giving donations has been a big impact there. That, that's that's really interesting. I think the NHS one is super interesting in particular because there must be so much data. I mean, that you know, apart from the value of that data, it's also mm. the impact it could have on people's health and people's lives in terms of the analysis of that data and outcomes and so on. I mean, if that really is being properly um, used and manipulated and to extract the relevant conclusions from them, I mean, that's incredibly important, isn't it? You know, not just to the UK, but to Health, no, the impact's health broad, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. I heard the NHS is one of the world's biggest employers, I think, other than the Indian railway system. I don't know if that's... Well, wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised, yeah. <laughs> I wonder that's if the Indian really railway impressive, system uh... uses any logo. <laughs> well, I mean, we have uh, so some of the tools that we use, we have seen kind of flickers of it in the NHS. So whether they have uh, kind of actively decided to use low code, I don't think. But they certainly do benefit from some of the, the tools that, that we also use. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So you seem keen on Microsoft tools. Uh, do you think they're the main game in town? Or you know, the, what others do you think? You, you do use another platform, I know that. Can you tell me about your choices in that regard? Definitely. So I think when we started out, um, a lot of, lot of kind of our, our progress had been informed about the problems we were trying to solve for ourselves. And at that stage, there was, uh, there seemed like a limited offering. I'm sure uh, now I would say that there were more options than we were aware of. But as a small business, we were, we had to watch what the budget was going to be like. And we equally had to match that up with what we were trying to achieve. So we needed a tool that kind of worked on both of those fronts. And that's where Microsoft, I mean, the scale that they've got really came to the party. So we started with a tool there uh, called Microsoft Dynamics, and that's what we used internally. And over time, Microsoft uh, released a, a new tool, which allowed you to uh, start with a lot less functionality, but you could build up from there. And that's where this whole Power Platform idea came from. And again, that, that's one of the huge areas where low code enables this kind of um, uh, rapid um, kind of changes within a business, I lost my word in there, but because of the, of the price points. So we were able to move to this lower cost model, but have as much functionality. So it was a huge benefit for us to not sacrifice on any of the big things that we're worried about, but be able to run this at pretty much the same cost that your actual Microsoft Office license uh, will cost you on a monthly basis. So that was huge. And there are other tools um, out there in the low code space that are focused on internal business development, which is where Microsoft's platform plays. But their price points were different. Um, the learning curve was different. And so we felt that given the, um, the way that Microsoft is pervasive in all sorts of businesses across the world, whether you're using Outlook or Excel as a base, it was a great tool to start with. And, and we've been kind of really happy with that choice since then, because Microsoft invests so much in this platform. Uh, there's new updates from their side that we get to benefit from on pretty much a weekly basis. And so, you know, we're able to pass that on to clients and the solutions just keep getting better. Yeah, um, I, was, I was thinking that when you were talking about that, it's kind of inspired and almost, I mean, obviously Microsoft is a, maybe quite an obvious choice, but it's also, Fortunate to some extent that you pick something oh, that grows and grows and grows. So it's because it's so important to um, be using something which has got investment in it. Because it, if you're using a software which is not invested in, it's really diminishing returns, isn't it? Exactly, and that's that is the risk of low code. The, the big risk is you you do pick a platform that you build on top of, and you want to be certain that that platform is going to be around. Yes. And yes. You've got a good chance that Microsoft's going to be around for a while. So it, it does seem like a safe bet. Yeah. Um, well, that's so, great. <laughs> so they were, they were, they were the, now it seems obvious. And now that we're also aware of other um, kind of vendors in that space, still would choose Microsoft 
particularly for the business internal space. And we've almost split out our solutions into those two key areas. You've got your, your internal business solutions where you have your users that are licensed and then Microsoft works perfectly. That's, that's the right choice. When you want to build external applications though, then Microsoft's one-to-one -one licensing becomes a bit prohibitive. Yeah. And so we've moved on to, we've got Bubble as the external vendor we use when you want to solve, when you want to build applications like Instagram or Facebook, for example, if you wanted to build a social network, you wouldn't want each user that signs up to cost you an extra $5, for example. Sure. And that's, that's where Bubble's um, a really awesome tool to build on. So we've kind of picked those two for now and they've got very specific use cases and benefits. And uh, we do believe that over time, we will extend the amount of tools that we work with, but it seems like a good idea to get really uh, deep into understanding how these tools work and to ensure that when building things, it's done in the best practice way and there's solutions that will work for uh, both internal and external use cases. So I'm kind of interested in this is probably my own ignorance is, how does this interface with AI? How, can you give me some examples of low code interface where you're interfacing with AI solutions? Uh, again, uh, I've got to tip my hat to Microsoft. They are fully aware of how topical AI and machine learning are in the low code space, as well as the fact that a lot of people say, you know, you're not going to be able to solve those types of complex problems if you're just using drag and drop editor. Yeah. Microsoft have built their own suite of AI tools which are AI platform tools. So the ability to build a model which is going to be able to be trained by user user to uh, extract some key insights is now turned out from something which you know you needed a kind of PhD and something other to be able to handle to be something where people with a bit of logic and a deep understanding of the problem can build those things. So a AI is also something in the low code space which is uh, very accessible. Um, one of the good examples is reading uh, of information captured on contracts. So you've I, was got AI. That. I was thinking that when we were talking about yeah. it. Yeah, that's very little, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we've got, um, they've actually got pre-built models uh, around some of those things, like basic things like business card reader, but you could upload anything that an AI model that you can train over time will extract the relevant information from and can go and do all sorts of processes on the back of that or you, know, you can actually just store the information and, and use it at a later stage. So that's one example of highly accessible AI. I mean, that's almost drag and drop, that's pre-built, that's done. And you've also got the ability to then feed uh, information from your system into AI models, which you train, and they're quite logical to put together to extract um, a lot of other insights. And a good example of there is if you're dealing with a lot of quote data, and you've also got types of people who are quoting, you can start to, to work out you know, which of these quotes are likely to be successful, sort of a propensity type scale that you can build into there. And all of that's very easy to handle on, on the AI front, but also low cost. I mean, it's, it's not something which is priced at a point where it excludes SMEs. It's something which you know, a business which believes in that could, could easily access and pay for on a monthly basis. Yeah, yeah. And, and then they would know where to invest their time and resources having come up with that information and potentially make their business more profitable and more scalable. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, for sure. So tell me about learning low code. I mean, do you think this is something which should be almost a mandatory course at every university for any subject or should people be studying it at, you know, for the last two years of high school as an extra course so that everybody has some concept of how to move forward in the <laughs> world? It's an interesting question. Um, I'm not, I, I don't do... want to put you out of business, Nick, but I'm just thinking, you know, if it's this. No, no, sure. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's something we've grappled with a bit because one of the, the benefits that's often um, touted along with low code is, is this concept of a citizen developer. A yeah. citizen is someone who never actively sought to study programming or who ever even entered a role into the business that they're in with the idea that they're going to have any kind of IT hat on. And low code does enable these citizen developers to go out there and to build applications which, which solve their you know, day to day problems. Um, that said, I do believe that programming has, has a big place in terms of the technical understanding uh, that probably should be taught at schools, universities, etc. I totally agree. But I mean, yeah. this would be a good place to start, wouldn't it? And I, I'm not suggesting yeah. everyone's going to go and start doing their own low code, but at least if they had that mindset that this was doable, um, yeah. it would really expand people's horizons about what could be achieved in some situations, I would think. 100%. Oh, and, that's, and there's a huge rise at the moment in what are now, it's become quite a fashionable term, the, the non-technical founder or the non-technical CTO. 
typically roles that you know you'd expect someone to if you're going to go build a, a tech solution to have some kind of an understanding and the only reason that those roles are now popularized and able to exist is through low code but steve and jobs wasn't that technical was he you know he was just steve jobs apparently yeah now I, I need to probably research more before i have too strong an opinion but but he was certainly more on the marketing side and able to envision the impact that these applications and, and products that he was putting together could have. Yeah, he was more of some visionary and, you know, someone who could, well, he didn't manage the product day to day, the product manager, but he could envisage what he wanted to see, couldn't he? And um, yeah. 100%, yeah. And he definitely you know, got Steve Wozniak to do a lot of the, the grant work, I think. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, about 10 years ago, it'd be very difficult for a tech startup to raise money if they didn't have a t at least a technical founder, wouldn't it, I think? Yeah. Exactly. And, and again, that is actually a point I wanted to touch on at some stage is there's plenty of examples now if you go and research um, uh, bubble success stories of companies that have raised a serious amount of money. I'm talking, I think the one company raised 230 million euros for the idea and it's all built on a low code platform. So anyone who's thinking that, you know, this is just something that I'll build over the weekend to prove if people like it or to see how it works is that's limiting it. It really can go extremely far. Um, and you always do have the ability, if you are solving a proper problem, you can scale up to millions of users. And at that point in time, if you need to go and build something else, it's very easy to go. And you can have the money to do it at that point. Exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> so get to that problem. It's a good problem to have. Yeah. So data would be stored by Microsoft, would it, for low code development? It would be um, stored in the Microsoft cloud usually or whichever system you're using. How would that be stored? So they're very open. Um, yeah. the, Platforms themselves will have data storage capacities, but um, if you want to store your data on AWS somewhere or Microsoft SQL Server, you've got the ability to integrate with those as a backend as well. So you aren't you aren't tied in. There's no vendor lock-in across all these different tools, uh, which I think just you know even if you're wanting to use low code as a front-end interface to link up with legacy data or data stored somewhere else, that's highly accessible. You're not building, you don't have to start everything from scratch if you've, if you've really got something in existence. And how do you maintain low code applications? You know, do you need to update them? Do you need to do fixes on them? How does that work? Again, the benefit there is that it's sitting with the platform. So what they will do is spend a lot of their time and invest a lot of uh, money actually in, in terms of figuring out what's next, what type of features, as well as ensuring that everything that they've built on, because underlying the platform is actual traditional coding somewhere along the line. They've just modularized it and made it accessible. And they've got to keep that up to date with the modern changes. So they take that upon themselves. But what's nice is that typically just feeds up into whichever applications that you're using. And so you don't have the concern of thinking at some point in time, you're going to go push a button and everything is going to break. They make sure everything is compatible and the updates are pushed uh, almost automatically. If you are running a big application, you do have the ability to say, I'll wait a little while and then run the updates myself at a certain point in time. But it's all built in a way which it makes that whole process extremely easy and quite fail safe. So you don't have to have as much con concern around the system just falling over, you know, tomorrow. Do you Once have situations where you have sort of proper, you know, traditional developers you're working with who insist on wanting to write a bit of their own code into it and that makes updates more difficult? Do you ever come across that? So, um, well, <laughs> traditional developers always want to write code. It's I a, know, it's a, yes. Yeah. And then it's so, so hard to update it later if they're not around, right? Exactly. It, it poses a lot of uh, risk, actually, and, and yeah. a challenge to the process. Yeah. But you've got to be aware of that, I think. And, and nowadays, there's a low-code first approach. It means that businesses are actually starting to... It's actually quite interesting. The, some of the businesses who've typically operated in the space for a long time and who used to write code have taken a low code um, kind of choice and they become allergic to code, even simple little scripts that do minor things. Yeah, yeah. Be yes. done in low because code. you can't then apply the updates because everything will go haywire at that point, right? Because of some small amount of code that somebody's written in as a supplement. It, it, yeah, it's, so, it's fortunately not as bad as that. So you'll always have the core platform, which you can't edit. So that isn't going to be, there's no one's going to inject code in there that's going to then cause something to break at some point in time. But it's usually with things you're trying to extend. So uh, silly examples, you want to open a form and you want something to pop up that the user can click. And maybe that's not a, a component that's available. So someone will write a little JavaScript that goes and does that. Yeah. If it doesn't maintain that over time, that could cause problems. 
but the core platform is still going to continue to update and, and be up to speed with everything. It just might mean at some point you're going to have to get someone in to go and tweak that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it begins to look very odd or something like that, you know. Yeah. Based on the Which, underlying update. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So do you work with um, people in your business who are all based in South Africa or do you outsource to any other countries when, with your coders and people are working with you? But at the moment, we all uh, in house, mm -hmm. and it's an uh, intentional decision around that. Uh, I think I believe that the work we're trying to do, especially when there is a bit of sensitivity around low code, the, the output needs to be of an extremely high quality. And so we do want to bring, keep that internal as much as possible. There's a, you know, a wide range of skills in South Africa and, and in our business as well that allows us to tackle all these problems and to be in control of the process as well as what the output is like. So at the moment, we, we're keeping it all in-house. Um, but as capacity kind of increases, uh, there is a bit of a, a shortage of, of available developers in the market. So there will come a time where we might need to look at some, some outside solutions. So we've heard about some of your success stories, Nick. Tell me, are there any where it hasn't gone so well on some of your projects or you've just decided, well, actually, this wasn't the right solution for this problem? I don't think I've ever thought that low code was the wrong approach. Uh, I think the implementation can sometimes be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and the and that's down to, I mean, that's the same risk you've got in the traditional development place. That's the person who designed the solution and how they understood the problem and then converted that into technical detail. Uh, I've certainly come across scenarios where I think Ooh, that wasn't built as efficiently as possible. So th that does exist. I think the benefit of low code is we can kind of rip that out and rebuild it quite quickly if we need to. But I don't have an example in my head of, of uh, any failure around using low code and that, that it hasn't achieved the results that we expected it to. So how do you assess, you know, and whether you know, the, the successfulness of, of the solutions that you've created for your clients? You know, do you have feedback or other measuring metrics for this? I think there's, there's a couple of different metrics that you can look at. Feedback's really and to get that subjective uh, information from people who are using the system is, is critical. Um, because a lot of the solutions we've built at the moment, there's a focus on, on internal business processes or just kind of optimizing what's going on internally within a business. So it's quite easy to track. You know, if you are uh, adding different piece of information to a document every day, and now we've gone and automated that process, you are able to tell how much time that saved a person. And that's very easy to convert into a, a rand or a, a pound value. So you then can see, okay, this has actually got an ROI. And that ROI in the low-code space is achieved really quickly, the return on investment, to avoid acronyms. Um, and, and so that's, that's nice and easy to measure. Then you get your, your subjective feedback around, uh, is the tool making a difference in people's lives? And then you're able to have your, your tracking of, of various um, events within the system. How often is a certain thing occurring? How often are people logging in, doing X, Y, and Z? And then you can get a sense of adoption, which again kind of informs that this uh, solution would be having having a nice impact. So there's there's a few different ways, yeah. So which countries do you think are leading in the sort of development and also the deployment of low code at the moment? So I think so. Firstly, I mean, if I look at Microsoft again, they've only started really pushing this low code idea, even though the tool effectively has been low code for many years yeah. in the two or so years. And if you look at predominantly the types of, of low code platforms which exist, you're looking at companies based in America. So a lot of it gets done out there. And there's, there's organizations that predate us by you know, five years doing similar things based in America. Yeah. So they really are leading the pack. But then as far as um, using low code for internal purposes, and again, quite with the Microsoft hat on, that's, that's happening hugely in, in uh, kind of developed countries and you know, in not necessarily developed countries in Africa. So UK has got a, a huge uh, footprint around uh, Microsoft in the internal space, and there's a lot going on there. So I do think it's being uh, spearheaded in, in America, but the kind of um, methodology and the, the movement is, is starting to become quite prevailing in various different places in the world. I think there's a Gartner report that I think you referred us to that where the percentage of new applications developed by enterprises with low code was going to jump from 25% in 2020 to 75% in 2025. 
Yeah. What would account for that jump? I mean, that that's huge. Is that partly Microsoft driven, or is it everybody suddenly seeing the light? Or, or what, why do you think that's? I think it's. So yeah. I, I think it's it's a, it's a it's a twofold thing. I think because you can develop so quickly on low code, the the denominator jumps quite a bit. So yeah. instead of applications being able to be built in 2025, you've now got a thousand applications. And most of those are built on the low code space. So obviously, uh, low code is going to form a larger percentage of that, that overall number. So I think the speed to, to building definitely, but then I also think it's the adoption. There is certainly an increase in awareness in low code applications, in fact, that they can have. And businesses are turning to low code first, as opposed to outsourcing a six to 12 month project that's going to cost them a lot of money and require huge maintenance rather get that on the low code platform. So I think there is a maturity in the low code space, which is informing the adoption of it. And then also just, you know, the, the inherent benefits of speed and flexibility are gonna allow more applications to be built by more people, because you don't just need um, computer scientists out there building applications, it could be um, anyone sitting in the office space has the, the capability. So I think all of that is, is allowing a huge surge in, in the amount of applications that low code will uh, he builds why, on top. why do you think, you know, given the fact that the term was apparently coined by Forrester in 2014, was it? And then sort of the idea goes back to the 1970s. Why has it taken so long to catch on, do you think? Because a lot of people don't still know what low code is. Yeah. Um, you know, I think everything that's that's new, there, there is a time lag. I mean, even if you think of how long it took people to you know, adopt the internet or, or big changes that today we think are just completely normal. There, there is a lag. There's going to be naysayers. There's going to be your traditional ways of doing things that, that are a bit allergic to change. And, and I think there's, there's that component of it. And, and I also think there's a sophistication that takes a while to get to. And until that level of sophistication is met, the, the platform can't handle as many use cases as the typical user would like it to. So there's definitely an inflection point at some way along the curve at which low code suddenly becomes relevant to everyone, accessible, usable, and has the functionality to tackle all sorts of tasks. And that probably wasn't met you know, until fairly recently. I think even if you look at some of the low code platforms and the founders and the way they talk about the business, it has been a long journey to get to where we are today. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's probably why we needed that journey to happen. So it's sort of the commercialization of this low code product solution in a sense is, is developed. Yeah, and functionality, ideas, suites yeah. of features, yeah. um, you know, all these things that were our concerns to people have to be handled for before you get this mass adoption. Yeah. So, to get to I'm maturity. probably showing my own ignorance, but tell me, how would a blockchain solution interface with a low code solution? Have, have you worked on anything like that? We, we haven't ourselves, but I've looked a bit at this because this Web3 idea is becoming quite uh, interesting and gaining. Yeah, knowledge. I wanted to ask you about that. Okay. Yeah. So I, I've looked at it very briefly, and all I can say is that uh, Bubble in particular, and that's the right the way to approach that type of an application, already has integration points into certain um, uh, Web3 type vendors and solutions. So you could build a blockchain um, wallet, I think it was the one that I looked at pretty easily with low code. So it, Whilst you can extend low code with pro code, what you've also got is a lot of people who want you to be able to plug into their solutions really easily. So they will build connectors or plugins. And, and that's where that example is kind of solved because you'll go and say, all right, I want to use this tool here. You download it. Sometimes they're free. Sometimes they cost a bit of money. And then you know, within half an hour, you're able to have uh, a, a wallet set up on, on Web3. So could you build a metaverse virtual world environment using low code? Oof. Now you're asking me a tough question. I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure how far you could push it. Um, I suppose- I thought that might be a project for your spare time. Though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> would, would certainly like to say yes. I think um, you know, perhaps my own definition of what uh, the metaverse is and how broad it might be is, is making me a bit uh, reticent. But yeah, maybe it's a component of it. You know, you can start with a component. Exactly. Yeah. I certainly think it'll plug in very nicely at some stage and, and offer some solutions which you know, don't need a kind of a, a three month lag time. You can give people something that they need quite quickly. So I'm sure it will get involved and be a, uh, an important component of the metaverse or any other technology out there, which becomes highly relevant. Um, whether it could run the entire thing, we'd have to see. Yeah, I mean, there could be a, you could imagine a platform that would allow you to, to go onto it with the low code solution, couldn't you? Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. 
Mm. Cool. Well, there's a couple of questions that people have put in. Let me let me go through these. So, Andrew Wells, low code is highly attractive to non tech savvy business folk like himself, he's saying, but it seems to mean handing over control of your system. Can you reassure us about security? Shadow IT, et cetera. You made the comparison with Amazon, but doesn't low code mean even more control is lost for SMEs in particular? And he accepts you've partially answered this, but he was interested in this. No, definitely. There, there, there is. It's with everything in life, I guess, you know, if you want more speed or you want more of anything, you're typically going to sacrifice something else. Um, but that's where you can do a lot of diligence around the platform that you choose. I mean, people like Microsoft, it's relatively well known. They invest more in um, ensuring that the systems are as enterprise grade and secure as can be than a lot of our JSE listed companies make in revenue. So there's a huge amount uh, and they've got a lot of people dedicated to that. And then if you're looking at other low code platforms, you, you've got to do your homework. They are very aware of this as, as a concern that people have. Um, but their argument is pretty much as much as people are nervous about handing over control, they try to assure you that they are the best people for the job. And they actually lock it down in a black box because they're so confident in what they do. And they completely understand that the day that that is not true, they will lose millions of clients. They'll lose uh, everyone's trust in building on that platform. So they're very actively um, focused on that and ensure that, that these things are as secure as possible. But they provide tons of documentation. You can do a lot of research and get confidence around that. But there is no getting around the fact that they are going to handle that. But it is to your benefit because most yeah. people. And I suppose the other answer to that is it's sort of you know it's a balance, isn't it? There's accessibility and all of this um, functionality you're going to be getting for your business versus yeah. you know okay some some compromising potentially of data, but you can try to be as sure as you possibly can about that. There's always a balance there, I guess. Um, exactly, yeah. yeah. There's another question here, um, which I think also builds on something I was asking about education. Do you think low code is something that could be taught in schools? I can't imagine how much easier doing projects and note taking could become in university if we did. Hmm. I, I, so it's actually something I'm very excited about and very passionate about is the impact that low code can have on the job side of things as well. So yeah. you aren't, you know, you don't have to, you don't even have to have the ability to go to schools and university, etc. If you've got an internet connection, you can upskill yourself very quickly and become relevant in the space. So I do think it's got a huge amount of relevance to, to people. And we're quite keen on the fact that over time, I think it's something we'll get to in a few years, but to almost run an academy where people who haven't had the ability to go and learn a technical coding, but have, have an aptitude and an interest in the space can be quickly upskilled. So I think it's got a lot of relevance everywhere. And, and I do think that it might make sense at some point in time for less technical people at schools who don't want to do programming, actually rather just do a bit of low code, which gives you that technical understanding without the need to go to all the kind of levels of detail. Yeah, I mean, I think your the idea you just expressed about an online academy would be amazing. I mean, you know, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, I would sign up for that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, what this just last question, what about when second last, how is the funding scene um, for tech businesses in your area in Cape Town in South Africa in general? You know, obviously Silicon Valley is the main place to raise money but it, how, how mm. is it in South Africa? We, we do have some challenges in South Africa. I think there's, um, there's a risk aversion to a degree um, and, and the types of VCs around aren't necessarily um, revenue VCs or early stage funders. It's not that many angel investors. If you've got a business that is working, there's, there's funding available. And we've got some huge institutions which have a lot of capital to deploy. But if you just uh, have an idea and you're looking for the funds to get that going, it is a, it is a challenging environment. There is, it's hard to raise money. Um, and there's often a lot of strings attached, which mean even if you do raise money, if you get the thing working, you kind of sold your soul at some point. Yeah. So it is as, as open and accessible as some other areas in the world, which I think is... You know, a bit of a knock on impact. Um, they, they often say that Elon Musk wouldn't be Elon Musk if he stayed in South Africa. And that's kind of, you know, as a result of these types of things. Yes, yes, that's really interesting. This is, isn't it? That's, I'm sure that's true. Um, and the last question is, where do you see yourself and Revo in five years time? So I'm super excited about where we're going to go because I believe that the current business model we have is going to change fundamentally. So, so right now we're working with a lot of partners, we're building a lot of applications. But I think what low code is going to allow is a completely different way of us actually operating. 
So internally, um, the, the model will shift to, I think, always having the, the, the types of services that we offer now, but also being able to either build our own products, which I'm very excited about, and that'll be informed based on a lot of feedback that we get uh, from our clients over time, as well as potentially partnering on building products. And then I also see an opportunity in the future for us providing services to startups, where in exchange for kind of a, an equity component, we'd be able to provide the tech backbone and get people up and running there, which I think is- Yeah, I was wondering if you think of the incubator model, because I could see that hugely yeah. with what you're doing. Yeah, that, that's a very exciting future you have, Nick. Well, the time yeah, is going by very, very fast. Thank you so much for that wonderful discussion. I hope we can do another event in a few months' time and see what other exciting things you've been doing. So that brings us to the conclusion of the webinar today, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us. And thanks again, Nick, for being such a wonderful participant and speaker. So we look forward to seeing you again soon at another event. Thank you very much and bye everybody.